So Eva, without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Now, I just minimized everybody, so I don't see your facial expressions. Uh, so don't know that me or raise your hands, I wouldn't know. Uh, but yes, thank you for the nice introduction. And today we're gonna to talk about um, a project that's fairly interdisciplinary. So uh, it's dusty plasma, but it's also applied mathematics and fundamental theory. So I hope that that's gonna be interesting interesting for a big crowd. Um, and this project is a collaboration between Baylor University, uh, University of De Delaware, and University of Arkansas. And it's funded by NSF and NASA and the DOE. And I'd like to start with the conclusions because um, sometimes we run out of time. Uh, and just to give you a perspective on what this project is about. Now, the goal of this whole study is to develop a semi-classical discrete formulation of the turbulence in charge fluids and specifically dusty plasmas because we find them a very useful test system for novel theoretical and mathematical uh, theories. Now, the specific hypothesis we're trying to test is whether turbulence uh, is affected um, or it's even driven by non-local interactions which manifest themselves uh, as anomalous particle diffusion and also stochastic disorder and both of these are characteristic of dusty plasmas. Now the specific theoretical methods we're going to talk about is called the discrete fractional Laplacian spectral technique, um, and it's mouthful. And, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about what each uh, part of this name means. Uh, but basically, it's a numerical technique that allows us to determine energy transport uh, throughout a system as a function of disorder, no local interactions, and scale. The main results that we're going to discuss today are two. Uh, one of them is that energy in the presence of super diffusive particles in dusty plasma, the uh, energy transport is enhanced at all possible uh, energy scales, which is somewhat what we expected because uh, super diffuse diffusion is supposed to do that to energy and therefore um, these kind of systems are more um, likely to develop instabilities and turbulences. But what was less expected and a more interesting result was that at key combinations of disorder and scale, subdiffusive diffusive particles can also yield enhancement of energy transport. And this is non-intuitive because we were expecting that uh, in the presence of disorder, subdiffusion is a process that always localizes energy instead of helping it transport. And um, at the end of the talk, uh, I hope we're gonna have time, uh, we're gonna compare some of these uh, results to uh, the latest experiments uh, with dusty plasma on board the International Space Station. Now, the outline will go as follows. First, we're gonna talk about what do we mean by semi-classical turbulence? Uh, that's a formulation that's useful for a dusty plasma. And then we're gonna talk about uh, how do we model anomalous diffusion with the fractional Laplacian operator. Uh, then we're gonna discuss the main, uh, the, the essence of the spectral method uh, of energy transport. And then finally, uh, we're going to talk about how this whole uh, numerical and theoretical approach scales to dusty plasma, what do the results mean, and how do we compare them to uh, results from the space station. Now, a classical turbulence, uh, you're probably very familiar with, with it, but it has a um, few characteristics. Uh, this is a, it's described by the well-known Navier-Stokes equations. And in this simplified representations of the equations, we know that uh, uh, these equations for the velocity vector are uh, giving the gate of change with respect to time or acceleration plus some convective term equals uh, the negative gradient of, of pressure plus some viscous uh, diffusive term. And I just want to mention that throughout this talk, we're going to um, 
we're going to use this symbol for the Laplacian, uh, but it's also the same thing as uh, the inverted the inverted triangle squared or the second derivative with respect to space. Uh, I just want to mention that because it's uh, depending on which book you're using, it may be different, but it's the same thing here. Uh, but the problem with the navier Stokes, as we know, is that so those equations, uh, since they're continuous and describe viscous fluids, uh, like very beautifully represented in this famous drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, Turbulence uh, described by these equations is really hard to solve. Uh, the, and the uniqueness of, and smoothness of these solutions are a millennial price problem. Um, now, if you think about turbulence in the quantum regime, uh, it can be reformulated and it's usually used uh, to describe a process occurring um, in a superfluidity studies of helium-3. Um, and in those cases, uh, a big difference is that the fluid is inviscid, or the fluids, because it's uh, exhibit two fluid behavior. Uh, so in other words, they don't have viscosity. And also, um, the, the quantum turbulence exhibits uh, discretized vortices, or quantized vortices, uh, which oh, these things simplify the math. So many times quantum mechanics offer it simpler math because it's a, a, in, in discretized matrix form, uh, but they have complications of their own because of quantum effects. Um, and now, here we propose to combine aspects of these two formulations in what we're going to call semi-classical formulation of turbulence, uh, which it still will be applied to classical system, uh, but it does uh, have an element of the quantum formulation. Now, what works for all formulations is the, co the concept of energy spectrum. In other words, you're probably are familiar with the Kolmogorov energy spectrum, uh, which is a representation of turbulence as a process that drives energy from bigger scales of, let's say, vortices into smaller vortices, into smaller, smaller and smaller scales until you hit an individual particle dissipation scale. Um, and, but the, in the Kolmogorov energy spectrum theory, uh, energy flows from bigger to smaller scales uh, in a uniform way. Now, what we want to do is take the same concept, um, apply it to a system that's both viscous, but it also exhibits discretized vortices. And we also want to generalize it by allowing energy to not, and the energy cascade not to move uniformly across scales, but maybe non-uniformly. And this is what happens when we have more exotic interactions, such as non-local uh, interaction or stochastic effects. Um, now you ask, well, is there any physical system that this, that this such a formulation describes? Yes, this is uh, a very the very useful system where to test such a phenomena is a dusty plasma, um, and I've I've seen that you've had Ed Thomas talk uh, probably a few weeks ago, so I assume you're expert on dusty plasma. I'm not going to go into the very details of it, but basically it's a, a multi-component plasma where, in addition to electron ions and neutral uh, atoms, now you have charged solid or liquid particles that we're going to collectively call dust. And dusty plasmas naturally occur both in, 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 in natural systems, but also in industry. And we also, um, people like me, dusty plasma physicists, will use them in experiments in the lab. And dusty plasmas, they can naturally occur in reactive plasma, so they can grow out of just the plasma particles uh, to Plasma particles can uh, grow into nanoclusters and then aggregates and powders. Uh, so you see there is a wide range of scales that can be represented by what we call dust in a dusty plasma, which is great because every time you want to talk about uh, as turbulence, you want to ensure that you're talking about multiple scales um, to test your, your formulations on. Um, but also in uh, what we're going to call dusty plasmas, where the dust is artificially introduced, uh, those systems are, are very convenient because they're highly controlled. Like we can take um, 
micro-sized particles that are manufactured to be perfect spheres, same size, same material, well, as perfect as possible, they're very expensive also uh, for a dust particle, uh, but they're very controlled. We can introduce them in the plasma and we can um, observe where they go and what they do. Uh, so this is this high level of control in such experiments is what makes them very attractive for testing uh, theories uh, of transport models. Now, um, Specifically, dusty plasmas exhibit all of these features that I was talking about in the semi-classical idea of turbulence. Uh, but at the first and foremost, as I said, they're very attractive because um, the dust particles themselves, now they will be the carrier of transport in this uh, whole talk. Uh, the dust particles themselves, if they're on the order of a micron size, 10 microns, this is uh, observable with a video camera, which means that with particle tracking, so particle velocity techniques, you can access, you can monitor all of the particles' positions and all of their velocities as a function of time, which, as we know, allows us uh, access to the entire phase space that's uh, created by the dynamics of this ensemble of particles. But it, it also allows us to do very meaningful statistics on these experiments. Um, so so this, is, this is great. Um, in addition, to balance dust particles in a dusty plasma experiment, um, so they get charged from the, from the plasma, they repel each other, so we put them in external confinements. Also in gravity experiments, uh, the dust particles of micron size tend to fall down due to gravity, so we balance them with electric field forces. So in these experiments, we feed energy in the system all the time, and the particles through their interaction with the environment dissipate energy all the time. So there is natural flow of energy in these experiments that can be used for uh, the study of, of turbulence. Um, so an energy cascade is easy to achieve, in other words. And then as I said, well, discretization of vortices. Now, let me be clear, I don't mean quantization, uh, I mean discretization. Uh, Quantization can occur if the dust particles approach a nanometer size, uh, where small quantum effects may be important. But uh, at the micron size, what we mean is that, yes, the classical particles, but this is a discretized fluid where the, the, you see individual particles. So we can uh, identify scales of vortices by number of particles participating, which makes this, this system very attractive for a discrete matrix linear algebra type formulation of the problem. And they're also viscous, so you can define viscosity between layers of, of uh, particles moving in a shear flow in a dusty plasma. So that's also very interesting. So, so these, uh, these um, are rather attractive features. Um, and then finally, as you said, dusty plasmas are inherently uh, have stochastic disorders and non-local interactions. Stochastic disorders usually happen because of charging processes that are random or semi-deterministic. Now, the dust particle in the plasma naturally collects electrons and ions, um, and it gets overall negatively charged, but uh, this charge can fluctuate because of this collection. A constant collection of particles. Now, when uh, the overall negatively charged particle interacts with ion that pass um, close by it but don't really get collected, they get deflected and form what's called the ion weak field um, in weak field structure. Now, for a next particle that's located somewhere in the vicinity of this first particle, now there is a a microscopic region of positive space charge that acts to decharge the next particle coming uh, downflow from the first one. This is not a completely deterministic process of what the shape of this wake field structure will be and how it's going to decharge other particles if all the particles are moving. You can also have, well, that was fast because it was energetic particle impact. Let's do it again because it's rather satisfactory. Uh, but you can have energetic particle impacts that can uh, knock electrons off of the surface. 
uh, you can have thermal excitation of um, uh, photo yielding photoionic emission. You can have, uh, if in experiments with UV irradiation, you can have photo emission. So you see it's a zoo of, of processes that can happen on the surface of the dust. Uh, and what's in common to all of these processes is, yes, um, to an extent we may know what the source is and we may try to quantify them, but they do have, they do have a stochastic component uh, to them which adds stochasticity of the charging and the system itself. So this is what we're going to mean by disorder, random disorder, stochastic effects, and dusty plasma. The non-local feature, now this is less trivial to explain, uh, but I will borrow an analogy from um, um, a, a very renowned mathematician, uh, Caffarelli, who, uh, who uses diffractional equations the same as us. Um, but pretty much you can think of no local interactions between dust particles to result um, to be a, a long distance communication of particles uh, through what we can think of as an ion atmosphere. And now, um, and the analogy is the same as thinking about how different points in ocean, in the ocean, uh, communicate with each other through the atmosphere of the Earth, and uh, same kind of mathematics is used to describe that. Uh, but basically, the result is that the particle uh, over here can feel uh, changes of particles further away uh, through this uh, dense, density changes of uh, the ion atmosphere that connects them all. Now, this can be somehow somewhat manipulated. So the characteristics of this non-locality, it's strange and its ranges can be manipulated externally in an experiment by changing the external electric field. In the presence of no electric fields, the dust particles that are overall negatively charged form uh, spheres of um, ions around them um, and, and their interaction between two shielded uh, dust particles plus the ions uh, spheres around them uh, is what we're going to call, what we call the Yukawa interaction, or sh it's simply a shielded Coulomb uh, force between the two. Now, if you apply um, electric field in a, in a single direction, uh, let's say to the right uh, for this particular picture, now uh, the dust and the ions split. And now, if you apply uh, an AC field uh, that's going in both directions, then you can create, let's say, two ridges of positive charge around the dust. Um, so you see how the shape of the ion uh, field or atmosphere around the dust has changed. This introduces more terms. To these interactions and these terms can be chosen to fall well they end up falling less fast than exponential and an example recent example from literature uh, was it specifically in this kind of mechanism where we vary the electric field in the symmetric way uh, the contribution from from this modification on the ion spheres um, is what's going to be called the dipole-dipole mechanism. So these particles end up uh, communicating as dipoles, and we know that dipoles don't fall as fast. Uh, the dipole interaction acts at a longer distance. And they can be, and this is one that's derivable, but there are many, uh, many more terms. This is an expansion, uh, really. So there are many more non-local terms. And this is what we, we are going to mean by non-inherent non-local interactions in dusty plasma. Now, moving to anomalous diffusion and fractional nucleation, these non-local interactions, um, we, it's, it's commonly uh, assumed that they manifest themselves into anomalous particle diffusion. And we think that particles moving according to anomalous diffusion mix the energy in the system in such a way that can cause instability or even turbulence. By diffusion here, we simply mean random motion of a particle due to gradients in the environment. 
way to observe diffusion from a dusty plasma experiment is by, as I, as I said before, since we observe these particles with a camera, we can extract their positions uh, as a function of time, and we can plot their mean square displacement, uh, which is a measure of how much they, they uh, area, they're pretty much uh, swiping as they, as they move with time. Um, and it's known that classical diffusion, randomly moving particles, uh, like the classical Brownian motion described by the, the classical diffusion, um, is a process where mean square displacement uh, is growing linearly with time. If it grows faster than time, we are in the super diffusive regime. If we go slower than, than um, linear with time, we're in the sub diffusive. The second observation uh, that you can get from an experiment to determine whether your particles are in any one of these diffusion regimes is to plot the, their, um, the distribution function of either displacements or velocities. So this one is a unitless example of a probability distribution function of the particles, displacements, or velocities. Now, in the classical case, again, if the motion is random, uh, classical diffusion is described by Gaussian. And you probably know because of the central limit theorem, a series of random events always limit to a Gaussian. That's, that's what this stands for. Uh, it, it is somewhat well known that um, super diffusion is modeled, super diffusion, the red one, is modeled by a Levy distribution. And now a Levy distribution is characterized by skinny peak and fat tails, and you can't see them here, but if you zoom in, you're gonna see that as uh, the tails, as we, as we continue further out in the probability distribution function, the, the tails of Gaussian fall exponentially, but the tails, tails of Levy do not fall exponentially. Um, and what this means is that, well, there is a non-zero probability that these particles can make huge jumps or can, can, can have huge velocities. Now, it's, it's not agreed what distribution um, really fits subdiffusion because subdiffusion is very dependent on the physical mechanism that drives the system. But what's agreed on is that in nature, in diffusion process, if, they, if, you, if you can observe them forever, as time goes to infinity, it's either a Gaussian or a Levy. And there is a proof for that. So we are inclined to think that the subdiffusion is some type of combination of Gaussian plus Levy distributions. And this is, this is sort of uh, what this may look like. Uh, so it's a distribution that, yes, it looks like a Levy, uh, but it's a, bit, a little bit fatter in this intermediate region. Now this distribution to become truly subdiffusive has to be truncated somewhere. It has to be, uh, you should not let its tail to go to infinity because then again, in this limit, if it's, if it's gonna limit to a, to a levy uh, type distribution. And just to visualize that, uh, we've used just artificially generated particles using these distributions. And you see classical diffusion particles, what you might expect, they just move randomly with, in space. Uh, in the super diffusive case, um, you see these big jumps, right? And if you notice, the order of magnitude becomes two, three times bigger, and this is actually zoomed in. These jumps can go even further, again, because of the, the presence of these tails. And subdiffusion, the cumulative effect of subdiffusion is that the particle ends up being on the spa same spot. Now the question is whether this is because there are longer waiting times in between successive jumps, or it actually can jump far, but it's actually also very likely to jump back uh, towards the origin. Now this is, a, this is one of the questions that we address here. Now, the fractional Laplacian is a very convenient type of operator in, in such system uh, for the following reason. Asymptotically, this, uh, so this exponent alpha that we can extract from an experiment, from a plot of the, of the mean square displacement, goes roughly uh, like one, well, the fractional Laplacian goes roughly like one over alpha. 
So you can extract this from experiment and you can obtain roughly uh, the value of this fraction of Laplacian. And yes, this Laplacian, Laplacian uh, if since they're, they're uh, uh, opposites, if alpha is bigger than one, S is smaller than one. If alpha is, is smaller than one, S is bigger than one. But if we, if we plug this here, then this fractional Laplacian models um, anomalous diffusion. And now why? Because uh, we say anomalous diffusion happened because of non-local interactions. A local operator, which will be just the fractional Laplacian raised to a power of one, which is just a normal Laplacian, is an operator that moves uh, the particle or the traveling entity one nearest neighbor at a time, uh, and, uh, and this is why it's local. So it's the action of this operator results in a displacement that's only one nearest neighbor apart uh, in the neighborhood of the point where you start. So, and as you see, with time, you, uh, the, the spread of, of this operator is rather slow and uniform. A non-local operator by definition means it's, it's an operator or a function uh, whose, when it's applied to a certain point in space, its result is dependent on all of the other points in space, right? This is what non-locality mean. Now, now um, in a numerical simulation, you can't really calculate at each time step the effect to infinity, so you got to truncate somewhere. And the truncation of how many neighbors per time step do we think is enough to call it infinite, but still not break the computer, is what we're going to call the, the influence. Uh, but in principle, a fractional fashion at each time steps, it, it's, it takes contributions from all of the neighbors. And this is why it's, it's suitable for modeling non-local effects that cause this anomalous diffusion that can take your particle from, from uh, the original position to infinity at each time step with, with some probability. Now that was, that was uh, first math section, second math section will be about, well, now that we have a good convenient way to model this non-locality, how do we calculate energies um, in this, what we call the spectral approach to, to energy transport? Now, uh, as I said, the, the, the key here is that this is a discretized, uh, the discretized uh, linear algebra matrix type approach to a transport problem. We start with the Hamiltonian of the system, and Hamiltonian we know from classical and quantum mechanics is just um, incorporates all of the kinetic properties and the um, potential properties of the media of interest. Now, as we said, the fractional Laplacian is going to be the kinetic element uh, with a non-local uh, feature. And now the second term, um, really this notation probably is more familiar uh, to, to quantum mechanics, but it's really just linear algebra notation, which means that we, this term creates a distribution of random energies throughout space. It's assigned to each point in space, a random small energy, and, it, and this energy is selected randomly from some interval. And this interval can have a distribution, but for the purpose of this study, we fix this distribution to be flat. In other words, once you fix some number, say the C is 10, so from minus five to five interval of unitless disorder, uh, with equal probability, you can assign any one of these disordered values to any point in space. What the, what the result of this is you create a random um, energy, potential energy distribution in the space. So this is going to be our stochastic element. Um, the next step is uh, you fix and by the way, these deltas, uh, this is, again, delta uh, has the meaning of a single state in space. Uh, the space is a Hilbert space, um, which is more appropriate, again, for the matrix, um, a ma matrix representation. But let's say you fix your particle at the center of the space at the initial time at a single delta function. Um, and then the Hamiltonian acts on the space, and you want to see 
how far uh, this initial state can, can go. Um, and then let V prime be another state in the same space represented by certain combination of other vectors, uh, base vectors, other deltas, um, that has a certain scale. So 100 nearest neighbors or 1,000 neighbors, certain scale of interest. Now, the essence of this model and what we're going to be looking at as results is the following. The Hamiltonian applied to the initial, the iterative application of the Hamiltonian to the initial state is what encodes the evolution of energy of the system. And we know, again, back to quantum mechanics, maybe it's mentioned that the Hamiltonian drives the energy, uh, generated of an energy in, in a system. Now, um, as you compute iteratively uh, apply the Hamiltonian to the initial state, you get a sequence. Uh, in it, at each sequence, each term of the sequence, a single time stack. So this ends up being a time sequence of what happens where, with the energy. Okay? And uh, we define the mathematical distance between the sequence and any other vector in the space, any, any vector that's different than the initial space, right? That's all, that's all the math. Um, and this distance, a mathematical distance is really in, in the Hilbert space. It's a generalized Pythagorean theorem, uh, but it's basically one minus the projection of uh, this vector onto our sequence. That's it. The one minus the projection is the distance and we need to normalize this uh, just so that distance is defined um, and we normalize it by a Gram-Schmidt procedure, which is again, um, quantum mechanics um, type thing. Uh, but anyways, so now this distance, what it does, and then the proof, all the mathematical proofs are related to this distance value, uh, it shows if energy is transported beyond a given scale defined by your reference vector, V prime. And um, if you compute, so again, these are, these are matrices, so, uh, or sequences of numbers. Now, if you, if you compute this distance as each time step, and you let time go to infinity, well, again, the simulation, we're gonna have to stop somewhere. Um, if this time goes to infinity, this distance goes to zero, it means that your energy localized within an area proportional to the size of this reference vector. And a, a way to visualize it is again, imagine this is the total energy and as the, the uh, application of the Hamiltonian propagates it to, to next neighbors, it spreads, but let's say it doesn't spread too much, it stays localized within, as time goes on and on, it sort of circulates within an area of possible states and they will have a characteristic size, which is commonly referred to as localization length. Um, but if you can show that this distance doesn't fall to zero uh, as, in, as time goes to infinity, then we can conclude that energy, uh, extended state of energy exists beyond the examined scale. And uh, this means that, again, in the simplistic representation, that if you keep reapplying this at Hamiltonian, this energy is going to move away from the origin and uh, goes to infinity. This is how to visualize everything. Well, we in, in the, with everything put together, uh, all the diffusive behaviors and the simulation. So what we plot is basically distance as a function of these time steps, where again, time step is the number of iterations of this Hamiltonian. Uh, and we actually, so this is a, 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 was a preliminary result demonstrating that super diffusion is uh, uh, acts to delocalize energy. So this is for a fixed reference, so one fixed state. Uh, we're gonna see how it changes with different reference states. But, in principle, we expect, and that was what we showed, that super diffusion delocalizes energy, sub diffusion um, localizes it more than diffusion. And diffusion, and this is in the presence of disorder. Now, how do, why do we, so just briefly, why do we think again that, that this super, that, so these predictions, the last predictions from this model, 
why do we think that this is what may happen in a dusty plasma? Well, from literature we know on Earth that it has been demonstrated that a dusty plasma, that's where the particles are super diffusive at the short time scale, develop uh, global vorticity, which starts resembling turbulence uh, at the longer time scale. So we do know that there is experimental evidence that super diffusion and the onset of these instabilities are related. Um, and it makes sense because in the presence of the super diffusion, your particles can make these huge jumps, bringing energy uh, further out and uh, maybe enhancing this kind of global instability. We also have demonstrated with a many body simulation that um, the presence of disorder has opposite effects. That disorders, if you, we've generated a crystal of many particles and we've done analysis on uh, the um, arrangement of the structures and these smooth areas have a hexagonal structure and these defect lines that form, uh, they have uh, pentagons and heptagons, so they're more, more uh, disordered. Now, uh, and we perturb the crystal and see where the energy go, and we actually see that in the presence of disorder, energy does not spread uniformly throughout the exterior, but it somehow, it gets uh, more lo localized around defects, which makes sense because defects are particles that are not in an unstable equilibrium. So once you perturb the system, those particles get to dissipate majority of the energy. So our working hypothesis was uh, that super diffusion enhances transport, defects, localized transport. And sub diffusion, we didn't know, got it, got it. Well, working hypothesis was that it also uh, localized energy, but we saw, uh, as we're gonna show now, uh, a little bit different results. Now, how do we scale all of this uh, from experiment to actual simulation parameters? Now, in experiment, you start with uh, some kind of a, a cloud, uh, and its maximum scale is the size of the cloud. And now, you can if you want to create turbulence, you can perturb it either with a laser or with the electron gun, which uh, starts the formation of these vortices and the this energy cascades uh, until it gets dissipated at the smallest scale. Therefore, as we said, a very convenient system where the biggest, um, the biggest scale is the, the spatial scale of the crystal. The smallest scale is very well defined is the, the individual dust particle. Now to scale to our simulation. Now, by the way, our simulation was done in 1D, 2D, and 3D. And here we're gonna do 1D only because of this non-local interaction, which takes a lot, a lot of memory. Uh, but what's the clever trick is that, well, since we're only concerned here about energy transport through scales, uh, you can, with the, with the assumption that, well, a scale of a vortex in K space, uh, so, so the, the K number goes like one over uh, the, the scale of the vortex, um, and then you can create a space the K space, you can build it from these uh, delta functions that we were talking about. And now each delta function represents um, an individual mode that's possible into um, the whole dynamics. And now if you, at, at your real experiment, if you import the energy at the biggest scale, or let's say you perturb massively the, the crystal at the initial time scale, step, then your biggest scale now becomes the single delta function. So the equivalent of this action is to localize all the energy initially at a single state and then let it spread and see how many scales of, of, of vortices or states it can reach. Um, so in, in, in the sense, this uh, uh, reference vector that we're talking about now means um, number of scales, number of size of vortices of interest. Um, and then your minimum, so, so your, your minimum K number is actually, it's a single depth function, your maximum is the size of the simulation. Um, and the, the largest, the, the simulation should be chosen to be large enough to um, be, to, to correspond to the size of your crystal. And then uh, for a given Hamiltonian that we get from the, again, from the system, 
uh, we can compute the energy system and the distance. Now, briefly, I know I'm maybe running out of time and we want to compare it to experimental results, but uh, briefly, this is how it goes uh, from, from an experiment into the simulation. An experiment, you extract this mean square displacement, plot them at the function of time, you can extract this alpha. Uh, you can also get uh, the uh, distributions of uh, the electron ion densities either from a simulation of the discharge um, or from direct measurement in the experiment. And then from this, from the ratio of uh, these density in homogeneous, you may, you may find uh, what may be the charge fluctuation of dust if it's spatially distributed through uh, the plasma, um, or you can, you can get this also from simulations of, of uh, dusts and, 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 and uh, wake fields, uh, ion wake fields below them. But anyways, uh, from simulations experiments, we can extract all we need. These things turn into um, the scaling of the, of the diffusion component, as we said, the fraction of the Laplacian is one over the alpha that we get from experiment. The influence is, uh, again, again uh, how many neighbors do we allow to, to really affect the calculation at each time step because we can't go infinite. Uh, and then the size of the reference vector is the number of particles per um, characteristic scale of a vortex that we may be interested in. So this can be chosen the, uh, based off of the experimentalist's uh, interest. And then to scale disorder, we can compute. Uh, remember, disorder was a fluctuation in energies. If you have a distribution of charged dust particles that are shielded, um, but their charge fluctuates slightly, you can define some fraction of uh, percent fluctuation from a mean charge uh, that, that you see. And this is how you get dimensionless idea of what is the stochastic disorder. Uh, but important thing to mention here is that this disorder is stochastic in space. We do not let it change in time. So this is a limitation um, so far that we may, we may change in the future. And so all of these go into inputs of this code. So all of the inputs of this code are that you need to care for are this fractional Laplacian, the disorder concentration, this gauge of non-local effects represented by the influence, and this reference vector size. First, we examine if we fix all others. So actually, we're going to fix the fraction on the... On the um, Laplacian to these three values, where 0.9 is super diffusion, one is diffusion, 1.1 is subdiffusion. We're going to fix this for clarity because we don't have all the time. So in all of the simulations, those will be the three representative values for each regime. Um, in this specific um, example, we fix the, the range of non-local interactions, and we're first interested to see what if the scale that we're interested in is proportional to the range? What if they're equal at each time? Uh, and we fix them to 300, which is a good number of states uh, computationally. Um, it doesn't give too much error from the way we calculate the Laplacian, and it's also computational time is reasonable. Um, but when you do this, in, so this is your benchmark case. This is the classical diffusion. And you see how uh, this color again, and this is this distance that we're plotting. So the red color means energy transport, blue color, energy diet. So it's really like intuitive uh, that here's a lot of energy and here's no energy. And we see that, so the disorder increases from 10 to negative fourth as it increases to 10 to negative three, two, one. So across four orders of magnitude, we see that for small disorder, a lot of energy is uh, transported at this fixed scale. Um, and as disorder increases, energy decreases, um, the transport of energy decreases, which makes sense because we said disorder localizes energy. And, and we, in comparison to this one, we see that the uh, super diffusive case transports energy a bit 
further. So let's say even at, at, at a bit higher disorder, so you're gonna have more energy transported. And in contrast, in the subdiffusive case, energy suppressed like almost everywhere. And this is, and we can, we establish a region of interest where uh, these transitions happen to focus on, uh, because at, at higher disorder, at all disorders bigger than 10 to negative three, all energies are pretty much suppressed in all regimes. So disorder become very dominant thing and you, you can't really um, freely transport energy. Now um, for a fixed, a fixed disorder, let's say 10 to negative three, and this is again, think of it as a ratio of uh, fluctuations of charges across your system um, of otherwise identical dust particles. Uh, in fixed, again, fixed um, fractions, we fix the reference scale to be, again, equal to the, to the range of interactions, but we let them both vary from 50 states to 1,000 states and see what happens. So you are increasing the range of interactions, but also you're increasing the uh, reference scale together. And we see overall similar, like qualitatively similar behavior. Now again, this is your benchmark case where this is diffusion, normal diffusion, there is no known locality. This is just uh, what it should look without the anomalous part. Um, so you see this pretty much means that here you're varying from, um, for this disorder value, you're varying from uh, very small scales to very big scales, and you can kind of tell in this transitional region, so transport, so for this disorder, smaller scales will, will still get transport, and then as the scale gets bigger, the transport will be suppressed. This makes sense because as you get bigger and bigger, more disorders accumulate, and you can't delocalize the energy to infinity. Um, and we still see that the, the uh, non-local behavior in the, in the super diffusive case still enhances energy further and subdiffusive still suppresses it. With these, maybe so here, um, with, with these um, black dotted line are, are showing are some instances when mm, the, the, the behavior is not completely mo monotonic, but uh, we think that, that um, these happen just because those are, our error disorder is, is random. So we have various realizations of random disorder. So this may happen because of the randomness of the disorder. So it's not absolutely perfect every single time, uh, but overall the behavior is clear and it's similar. Now the unexpected uh, result happens when, now we, we uh, forget about the normal diffusion. Now we're just interested in the anomalous ones. Um, and what we do is we fix disorder, fix fractions to 0.9 and 1.1, fix the range of influence. So now your influence doesn't go to infinity, it goes to a fixed range. And we now we care to see what's gonna happen if now the scale is smaller or bigger than the range. Because all the previous cases, the scale and the range were going together. And now uh, the scale of interest is, is bigger than it can, can go from, so let's say if the influence is 300. Um, so in all of these cases below 300, the um, scale is smaller than the range and the behavior is a lot like before, it go from a lot of energy to less energy. Uh, and from 300 to 1000, the scale is bigger than the range. And we see in the super diffusive case um, with this, smallest uh, with these two spikes uh, uh, in, uh, omitted, but the overall behavior is very similar to what it was before. But in the subdiffusive case, we see this enhancement of energy at the bigger scales, even though when, when the scale was bigger, bigger than the range. And this is very unexpected um, because subdiffusion is supposed to suppress energy transport. And, and um, we have for, for maybe a year thought that this has to be some kind of a numerical glitch. So we did average more realizations of these simulations. We've improved the truncation techniques. We've proved that we don't have uh, too much error accumulating. This thing stays. So we believe that to the far, as far as we can tell, this is an actual effect. 
possible explanations as follows. In a system with disorder, uh, the disorder defines a characteristic localization length, as we saw before, uh, that localizes things at a certain scale. Uh, so subdiffusion is, is another type of phenomenon that localizes energy, but it's a different kind of mechanism, and it has its own different scale as well. Now, as we said, subdiffusion, if we think about it as the possibility for, for long distance jumps, but that can also jump back. Now, if the scale of jumps that are allowed by subdiffusion um, is mismatched uh, with respect to the scale of the disorder, now we think that actually the two can cancel. And to see this better, we come back to the uh, probability distribution functions. Uh, remember, we said Gaussian is diffusion, Levy is super diffusion, and this in between that needs to be also truncated as subdiffusion. And now, um, in the as I said, in the presence of the of disorder in the just the normal diffusion case, um, the transport will end up localized uh, in a certain localization length. So this is the characteristic scale beyond which uh, transport exponentially decays to nothing. Um, in the super diffusion, diffusion case, you allow for the possibilities of these huge jumps. And that's why these huge jumps, and, and we said these are orders and orders of magnitude bigger than the typical scales in the diffusion uh, regime. So these jumps always consistently enhance transport. And this is what we observe, and we believe that's, that's physical, that's real. Um, in the subdiffusive case, localization can be enhanced if the scale of the, local, of the, of the subdiffusive jumps is somewhat comparable or smaller to the characteristic localization length uh, defined by the disorder, because then it jumps back and forth, but overall within the same region, and it ends up being uh, actually enhanced the localized around the origin. Um, but if the scale of the jumps is bigger than the localization length, um, maybe the particles can escape and the transport, transport can go beyond the, um, the localization length. And the way to, do, to sort of visualize this is uh, we take this distribution, the hybrid one, the Gauss plus Levy, and depending on where you cut it, so this is the line where to cross. If you cut it before that line, it's going to resemble more Gaussian. If you cut it after that line, it's going to resemble more like Levy. And we show you a cut before and a cut after, and you see the resulting particles before are exactly what, what I suggested. Uh, they are more localized even than, than the diffusive case. And the cut after gives you, now these particles, their scale of jumps is not nowhere near super diffusion, but it's slightly bigger. And now there is a possibility for them as they're jumping back and forth uh, to actually delocalize energy further away from the scale that, that's defined by this localization length. Finally, that was all the theory and with two minutes to spare. Um, here's some confirmation from microgravity experiments. Now, um, we are working for the Plasma Crystal 4 experiment on the International Space Station. It's located on the Columbus module um, in a laboratory cabinet uh, in one of th these drawers. So it's a small experiment. Uh, but a very cool one. It is uh, a DC direct current plasma discharge, uh, which makes it very useful for manipulating electric fields. Um, and we in inject particles, and since they're in microgravity, you can, they kind of like levitate in the bulk of the plasma, uh, which is more interesting than what we, what we see on Earth. Um, and we monitor those with the video cameras, so this is a, a photo of the discharge. Here's a cloud. And if we expand it, very interesting thing about this, these microgravity plasmas, is dusty plasmas, is that they form filaments. Um, and you wouldn't expect this necessarily having in mind that these, these clouds are in microgravity. So there is no up and down, left or right. They're supposed to be floating. Um, and also we apply very fast switching electric field that's symmetric 
which average, it's, it switched so fast that the average electric field on the dust particles should be zero. So they should really actually levitate in the field of view with no, no, uh, no force on them. And they're in the bulk plasma. They're not in the sheet. They're not close to the glass, nothing. Yet again, they're not homogeneous. They form these strings. And there are various um, hypotheses of, of why this happened, but I'm, I'm going to show you that um, this kind of structure results into the kind of diffusion we're talking about. Now, and these are just three examples of, of, of clouds from uh, the latest campaign that, that we received data from, campaign seven. And you have three different pressure regimes. Um, and you can see, uh, if you zoom in, you can see individual particles. Uh, and you can actually calculate their um, correlation, pair correlation function, which pretty much tells you uh, what is the likelihood to meet another particle um, at, a, at a given uh, distance. So this tells you order, how ordered those are. And we see that at lower pressure, uh, well, this is not too smooth in the middle, which means that, well, these particles, it, they ordered, but they're less ordered than as you go to higher and higher pressure, this become very ordered structure, and you can see this clearly on these videos. So chaininess in our world is what order means uh, in this specific experiment. Um, as order increases, you would expect them to be more stable and sort of more classical. Uh, but, and, and yeah, in lower pressures, we do see them uh, develop waves if we move them around. So we can't, so this order is confirmed that it's higher at the 60 pascals versus 1420 because at 1420, if we move the cloud, it develops instability. No instability ever happens in this mechanism uh, at the 60 pascal. If, uh, again, those are spontaneous though, spontaneous instability. It's just if the cloud is moving, it develops it itself um, instead of externally perturbed um, disturbance. Um, now, to what we did to these to these uh, data sets is we computed mean square displacement and we show here the linear um, the linear plot the the red ones are linear fits uh, and the blue ones are power law fits and this is what we were talking about when we tried to extract the anomalous diffusion type behavior and in all regimes it looks like the particles are super diffusive right so so they do if the power was bigger than, than, um, than one, the plot goes faster than linear. And we see uh, these, these are super diffusive. So we conclude that this is the dominant process. However, we don't see them to jump away uh, the same way we saw the, 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 the truly super diffusive data sets. Instead, what we see is, is we, um, actually we can plot the distribution functions of their velocities uh, and this is in the axial directions, so along the, um, the chains and the radial direction will be across chains. Um, and when we plot these velocities for the different pressures, we see, uh, and we try to fit some distributions. Um, and this is a Maxwellian distribution is our version of a Gaussian. Um, and we also fit a few two more non-Maxwellians. So Maxwellian plus some fat, one form of fat tail, which is uh, given from a Kappa distribution. And then the other one is a Maxwellian plus another form of fat tail, which is a Cauchy. But they're not Levis. And Levis were the ones that are really, really skinny and really make these huge jumps. And we see, well, no, we don't observe these huge jumps. So it's something intermediate between this true super diffusion and, and, the, and uh, the Gaussian or the Maxwellian. This behavior gets even more pronounced when you go in the axial direction of the chains where, where actually these distributions become really pointy and they develop a more pronounced um, big jump kind of behavior. And now they start fitting Cauchy distribution, which is a more closer to the Levy one. And now what, what is the explanation? I mean, at higher pressure, we saw that we have more order, more structure, more stability, no self-excited wives, but we do have these tails, which means that they should be particles that are doing weird stuff. 
And we actually, yes, we do see them. Um, and these are a bit annoying to, uh, I can't stop them. But if you look at this ordered structure, you have particles here and there that do this, this uh, uh, weird jump. And if you do particle tracking on the structure, actually this is a single particle, but the tracker loses it and it shows up again. So it's single particle that goes, you see all the other ones go and chain the structure, but this one goes across and up and down, makes these big flights that are not huge, but, they, it, but it also, also tends to return, right? So it doesn't go just further out of the clouds, but it returns back to its origin, which is what we thought is gonna be subdiffusion. So now we think that these clouds actually exhibit subdiffusion, and um, the next, the next uh, um, set of experiments we, we've done, but we still don't have the data, that's why I can't show you the data, but this is a preliminary data from previous experiment. But the next, I, the idea is that now that we demonstrated that these clouds in space actually show this very interesting anomalous diffusion for sure, but is it a super diffusive or is it a sub diffusive uh, behavior? Now, the next step is to perturb them um, with a laser, which creates vortices um, and obtain the energy distribution. How does it go? And see if we can see the same predictions as from the, the theoretical model that for even for sub diffusion, you're going to see energy enhancement at certain scales and that all. Uh, and it, it, all scales will be excited at a truly super diffusive um, experiment. So this is this is preliminary data that we used to, to develop this proposal. The actual data that we're waiting on from this campaign nine, um, the, the campaign was successfully performed and we are still waiting on the data. We believe it's delayed because of COVID reasons, but um, if we have it, uh, you can hear more about it on my APS talk. And with this, and now I'm a little bit of, over time, I hope this was worth your time. Um, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much. Very interesting.